call them logs. But we was good swimmers. We taught ourselves to swim. Dogs paddle at first, and then the old breaststroke. And that was the best one of the lot, that one. You could go for miles doing this. And we made sure it was high water sort of thing. So you get dead water. So all you got to do is swim straight across the river. And you fetch up a, 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 what's the name of that wolf? Wallace's wolf, finish up there, get in a breather. Mind you, our face was black. And the time you pushed, say, half a dozen dead cats, French letters, and oh, you call them condoms now, you kids. Dead cats all out of the way, rats. It, nothing, there was nothing wrong with us. Tower Beach was open until the 1950s when public attitudes towards pollution began to change. This stretch of the river was by modern standards filthy. It was so contaminated with sewage and effluent from factories, no fish could survive in it. Londoners have long been resigned to the idea that the Thames, as it flows through the centre of the metropolis, is biologically dead. Yet in the past, the river was a great natural resource for London, providing the capital with fish and drinking water as it grew to be the largest city in the world. Today, along its 215-mile course from the source to the sea, it remains vital for London and is far richer in wildlife than most imagine. On the mud flats of the Thames estuary near Leon Sea, wintering wading birds feed ahead of the incoming tide. These reaches of the river were badly polluted in the last century and suffer today from toxic chemicals which have killed shellfish. But the fish and wildlife never completely disappeared from the seaward part of the Thames. In recent years, the wading birds have moved upriver. Large flocks of redshank wheel above the Thames where the new road bridge is being built at Dartford. They roost on the sludge beds of the power station at West Thurrock. Large numbers of grey heron make for West Thurrock power station, which provides them with an easy meal. Thames water is pumped into the power station as a coolant and the filters catch large numbers of fish. These are put back into the river at a small outlet. Herons and gulls queue to feast on the power station fish. Each spring, elvers, baby eels, travel up the Thames on the flood tides. They've crossed the Atlantic on ocean currents from their spawning grounds in the Sargasso Sea. Elvers now migrate right through London to the upper reaches of the river. The Thames naturally has a rich variety of fish. As well as the sea species of the estuary, like sea bass, there are fish like the flounder, which can live in both salt and fresh water. Flounder migrate between the sea and the brackish water in London, and their young move a long way upstream. The mix of salt and fresh water constantly changes in central London, according to the strength of the tides and the flow of the river upstream. Freshwater fish will come down to meet the sea fish in the middle reaches. There are perch in central London, as well as dace and sometimes roach. Thames fish have no economic importance today, 
but scientists from the National Rivers Authority net them to gauge the quality of the river water in London. Fisheries officer Steve Coldclough. The sort of fish that we find in this part of the Thames really depends on where we are in the state of the tide, the amount of fresh water flow in the river, and the weather conditions. But today we've caught a fairly mixed bag, which is typical of this part of the river. Some freshwater fish, some marine fish. We've got dace, roach, eel, smelt, sand smelt, uh, one or two others as well. Baby flounder is extremely small, only about an inch long. Uh, so it's a very good mixed bag today, very typical. You do you, Steve? These fishing expeditions by the River Authority are producing encouraging results. But nothing like the catch the Thames fishermen had before the Victorian era. A study of the history of Thames fisheries has been made by Wynne Wheeler, formerly of the Natural History Museum. It may seem strange to see people fishing here today, and indeed it is quite remarkable, but in the 18th century it was a very absolutely everyday occurrence, quite commonplace, because all the way up the Thames, in the central regions of the Thames, there were fishing communities. Battersea, Lambeth, Wandsworth, all had fishing, little fishing fleets, little communities that depended on the river for fish. The fishery was very well regulated and in fact was in the control of the Corporation of London and they produced all sorts of legislation to stop you fishing out of season, to stop you catching fish that were too small. The mesh size was even regulated. It was extremely well regulated in those days. And it was a very important fishery. There were all sorts of fish caught, uh, but the most notable ones, of course, were the salmon. Um, and in this area, this was a particularly well-known region, in the 1760s, there was a report of 170 fish caught in the salmon caught in a year. Smelt and flounders were all caught along the river. Eels, of course, were a very important food fish. The fish in the metropolitan region of the river began to die in the early 19th century. They were literally suffocated by the great metropolis which had arisen along the banks of the river. As Victoria and London grew, there were several problems that affected the river. One of them was the production of town gas produced for lighting and heating to some extent which resulted in very toxic effluents going into the water. The other one was, was the amount of sewage that got into the river. Now, in pre-Victorian period, we had cesspits throughout London. But once the Victorians introduced the water closet, it became a severe problem because all the human effluent went into the river through the town drains or tributaries of the river and got into the water of the Thames. Now, once sewage is in the water, there, is, there are problems because bacteria will decay this sewage. And in doing so, millions and millions of bacteria will take oxygen out of the water, leaving it devoid of oxygen for fish and other wildlife. As a result of this, we lost all the fish in the Thames. The salmon disappeared in the 1830s, smelts became very uncommon, and all the other fish just effectively disappeared. At the same time as Thames fish were dying, Londoners had over the centuries come to rely more and more on water taken straight from the river for their domestic supplies. The old communal wells had been built over and the efforts of the ancient company of water carriers were insufficient for the expanding population. As early as the 16th century, London's drinking water was being pumped from the Thames. The history of London's water supply has been researched by John Graham Lee. The first commercial concern was the London Bridge Water Works, which piped water into houses. It was founded by a Dutchman, Peter Morris, who had the ingenious idea of fitting water mills between the arches of Old London Bridge to raise water into the city. The next and biggest company was the New River Company, which built an artificial river in the 17th century from springs near Hartford into Clerkenwell. But by the early 19th century, Londoners were becoming more and more dependent on the River Thames for their source of supply. A number of private water supply companies were set up along the Thames in the late 18th century. This is the York Works near Charing Cross. New technology had made possible the use of raw Thames water on a large scale. 
From the 18th century, steam engines were brought in to replace water mills, windmills and horse-drawn machinery. The area the water companies could supply was limited by the water pipes they used, hollowed out elm logs which were sharpened at one end and rammed together. They couldn't carry water under pressure. As Victorian London's population rose dramatically, more and more water companies relied on untreated Thames water. At the same time, the fashion for flush toilets was washing sewage into the river. The same form of pollution which had killed the fish began to poison Londoners themselves. The state of drinking water became a public scandal in the 1830s. When cholera arrived from Asia, a new source of drinking water had to be found. In 1852, a law was passed making it illegal to abstract water from the Thames below Teddington Weir. Above there, the river was relatively clean. Ever since, water has been pumped to London from the non-tidal Thames. The fact that Londoners stopped drinking the river around Westminster did nothing for the fish in the river. Though the massive Victorian sewage works took the bulk of Thames effluent downstream, the river remained horribly polluted. It wasn't until much better sewage treatment in the 1960s that fish began to return to the Thames. Win Wheeler. Fish started to come back to the River Thames in the, in the 1960s. Uh, I first became aware of this when an engineer who was working building the West Thurrock power station uh, caught some fish as he was testing the screens down there. And these were rather unusual species, and he didn't recognize them, so he turned up in my office and asked me what they were. And they, they were indeed very interesting, but the most important thing was they were the first fish to be caught in that part of the river for many, many years. It gave me the idea that I could use power stations to catch fishes, which, which proved over five years to be very, very successful. And in those five years, I had a whole chain of power stations all the way up the Thames, as far as Wandsworth Bridge, catching fish on my behalf. Uh, we caught thousands of fish in those five years, and he eventually ended up with a total of 72 species by 1973. So that the, when the fish started coming back, they came back in considerable numbers, both species-wise and in numbers of individuals. The species caught now continue to surprise fisheries officer Steve Coldclough. Here's a mullet, a grey mullet. A little bit uh, surprising this. It's a bit further up river than we would have expected, but it has been a very warm spring and that may have something to do with it. We also have some eels here, which are rather difficult to hold, so I'll just point at them. I'm sure you can see them there. There's an unusual fish, a sand smelt. Rather unusual, this this far up the tideway again. Here I have two slightly larger fish, the species we've already looked at. There's a very fine dace. These fish are fished for in very large numbers further up the tideway, particularly in the Wandsworth to Richmond area, where anglers may catch as many as 30 pounds weight of these fish in an individual sitting. That's a very nice dace indeed. Here we have a, a mullet, which we've seen already, but that's quite a large fish for this far up the tideway. And uh, we're very pleased to catch fish like this. It's uh, something new to us this far up river. That's the thin-lipped grey mullet. Very nice fish indeed. Survival of fish in this part of the Thames is still dependent on the use of emergency measures to maintain the quality of river water. Thames water has developed an artificial respirator for the river called the Thames bubbler, which pumps oxygen into stretches of polluted water. The bubbler is used to inject oxygen into the river. Even though we've cleaned up the river to a large extent, we still have a phenomenon, particularly in the summer, when you get heavy downpours of rain, causing a lot of road runoff, which surcharges the sewage system. That runs off into the river. Now, if the whole system is under a lot of rain, we're all right. But what can happen is you get a localised storm in one area. Then all that road runoff comes off into a tideway fairly low in water. There's no real dilution and you can get the oxygen sucked out by the pollution as it moves down in a slug of water. 
The bubbler is here to sit on top of that slug and inject oxygen directly into it and thereby hold up the dissolved oxygen levels. That's really it in a nutshell. No artificial respirators needed for the upper reaches of the Thames above Teddington Weir. This part of the river never suffered devastation by pollution and has for 150 years been the source of most of London's drinking water and a haven for wildlife. The home of water voles and a rich range of riverbank wildlife, the Thames above Teddington has changed a great deal this century. Native species like the kingfisher have been joined by exotic birds from abroad, like mandarin duck escaped to the wild from wealthy homes near Windsor. All wildlife on this part of the river has been disturbed by the development of the Thames as a pleasure resort. The river here doesn't flow as sweetly as it once did. Towns have grown along its banks, which now discharge their sewage into London's drinking water. Though wildlife like the coot hangs on, the river isn't pure enough to drink by modern standards. One of the main intakes for London's water supply is Laleham near Staines. Above it are the expanding towns like Maidenhead and Oxford. Neat Thames water siphoned off along an aqueduct into the Queen Mother Reservoir needs extensive treatment. Phil Renton of Thames Water. We wouldn't recommend you drink raw river Thames water. It contains a high proportion of sewage effluent, and the sewage effluent contains potential pathogenic bacteria, like cholera and typhoid and polio viruses, etc. Plus um, a high proportion of intestinal bacteria. So if you did drink a, a glass of raw River Thames water, you, you run the risk of contracting some infection. 70% of London's drinking water is derived from the River Thames. We pump that water into our large storage reservoirs, and within those storage reservoirs, the action of sunlight and interactions between animals results in approximate 90% die-off of the river bacteria. The water from the storage reservoirs then flows down into our treatment works where the water is passed through beds of sand where a further improvement in water quality is achieved with a final chlorination which gives us a wholesome potable supply of drinking water for London. The creation of reservoirs to store London's drinking water has been a great boon to wildlife since the late Victorian period. Large numbers of cormorant, ducks and other water birds gather in the winter to feed and roost at Barn Elms Reservoir. The reservoir was built in 1897 and is now disused. Part of it's about to become a nature reserve. London's need for a decent water supply has been bound up with the fate of river wildlife for more than two centuries. The Thames today is still a very vulnerable river, though it's much cleaner in the middle reaches than 50 years ago. The return of wildlife, which was once extinct, gives some hope that it can be saved as a natural resource for London. At Molesey Lock, just above Teddington, the most extraordinary story is still unfolding. A trap has been created to catch Thames salmon 
returning after more than a century of extinction in the river. Peter Goff of the Thames Salmon Trust. Right, this is the uh, tenth salmon of the year. It's about six kilograms, I think. It's come all the way through the Thames estuary, past the Thames barrier, as the Parliament, and uh, made its way into this trap here at Moulsey. Salmon haven't made their own way back. Young fish have been put in the river, they've migrated to the sea as adults and then returned. But the Thames is clean enough now for them to reach Molesey from the coast. It will have uh, spent a little over two years at sea, I guess, uh, feeding usually up around Greenland. Fish of this age have come from Greenland. Yeah, this is definitely a Thames salmon. We've never had any strays or vagrants from other rivers, and none of our tags have ever been returned from other rivers as well. So. We can certainly say with no hesitation exactly what it is. Uh, every year we, we tag and mark specifically some salmon and we look at their return rates and we're quite happy that they're returning at a rate which tells us the hoving is indeed specific. Salmon are not yet self-perpetuating. There are too many weirs for them to make their own way to the best spawning grounds. Salmon ladders are being built to help them. But more and more of those introduced each year return to be examined under anaesthetic in the Molesey trap. Uh, the numbers broadly are increasing. Uh, there are problems sometimes with low flows, poor estuary water quality, but generally speaking, they're increasing. Well, it's fantastic to see salmon like this in the Tideway uh, and in the River Thames. They've come a long way, a couple of thousand miles from the North Atlantic to be here. It shows us really in, in a great way just how clean the Thames can be on occasions. And it also reminds us how important it is to rigorously retain those standards. Uh, after all, we drink the water in this river. The salmon have to live in there and breathe it all of the time, as do all of the other residents in the river. And it's very important for us to carefully retain those standards. Thames salmon and London's drinking water suffered the same fate in the Victorian period. The fate of both is closely linked again today. Okay, here you go. All right, she goes. She's going now for good. <laughs> 